Again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is um, National Estuaries Week, which is why we wanted to have the event uh, during this week. Um, in a few moments, my colleagues, Dr. Amanda Bozar and Cindy Jordan, will provide you with an overview of the results of the initial phase of the USF Libraries Florida Environment and Natural History Collections Initiative. Uh, this initiative integrates more than 20 distinct collections that describe and document various aspects of Florida's natural history over the past 400 years. Those of you who've been part of the USF Libraries family for some time may be wondering why this and why now? So if you would bear with me for a moment, I'd like to share a few thoughts on those very reasonable questions. First of all, in terms of why this, we believe that these materials that constitutes what we're calling an a meta collection, a collection of collections, are very rich in information that's directly relevant to the most pressing challenges that face Florida, and by extension, the rest of the United States. Challenges including loss of biodiversity, the impacts of climate change on our coral reefs, and the challenges presented by the interface between the human and natural environments. Once these collections are fully integrated into this single meta collection. We believe it will be valuable to researchers in the humanities, social sciences, and sciences, and that these materials will inform current and future solutions to some of the problems that we're seeing emerge. Regarding the what, why now? Well, unfortunately, large parts of Northern California and Oregon are in flames and what are now being referred to as climate fires enormous regional conflagrations that are made more deadly and more frequent each year. Here in the east, due to a parade of tropical storms, we've exhausted the list of planned names for the tropical weather events earlier in this hurricane season than ever before. And all the while, as, as these cumulative effects of climate change continue to build and impact our lives, we still have leaders who suggest that the science is uncertain and, quote, don't think science knows, end quote. Well, for the record, science does know, and so does history. And until and unless minds are open to the actual causes of these challenges that we've created, uh, I'm, I fear that my children and my grandchildren are going to experience a deteriorated world that becomes increasingly difficult to live in. So this collection is dedicated to preventing that dire outcome. In response to the question, why, why this? I assert that these collections can open minds to solutions to our predicament. And as to why now, if not now, then when are we going to do this? So on, my, on that cheerful note, I'm going to turn the event over to Amanda and Sydney and allow them to share with you the wonderful work that they and many other colleagues, many of Colleagues on, on participating in this meeting tonight have been working together, collaborating on in order to build the Florida, the USF Libraries, Florida Environment and Natural History Collections. So turning it over to you, Amanda. Thanks so much, Todd. And thank you everyone for being here. And we really do appreciate you taking the time for us to kind of show you around a website, which we know can be a bit different. I also wanted to just take a second and thank our development and marketing team, Christina Wise and Maggie Trella for helping us to organize the event tonight. And to our joint team within Special Collections, um, it was a wide effort. So if you've ever worked with our collection specialist, Sydney Jordan, our archivist, Andy Hughes, our head of Special Collections, Tamara Taylor, we've all had a part in putting this together and we're all available to answer questions for you. Um, and I did want to just give a quick special shout out to our student ex assistant extraordinaire, Anna Tempkina, who did put in a lot of effort on this as well. Like Todd said, it was really pretty collaborative. So since a virtual tour of a website can be a bit different than what we're used to, I did just want to take a second and orient all of us a little bit first to what we're going to be looking at tonight. What you will see is an introduction to our current collections, as well as a few previews of some collections we're hoping to expand to in recent years or in coming years. And one of the things with this that's really exciting is a lot of this material is fairly contemporary. When we think of special collections departments and archives, we also think of very, very old things. It's one of our most common questions. What's the oldest thing that you have in special collections? And it's well over 2000 years old, by the way. 
But Special Collections is also about helping us move forward and see where we are going. And with the commitment that USF Libraries has to supporting research in scholarly fields investigating environmental issues, we are growing our collections to meet these needs. As Dean Chavez mentioned, we already have a large holding of materials spanning across ecosystems from professional scientists serving in academic and other public service roles, as well as from government officials, local activists, and other types of scholars. In addition to contemporary scientific research and public policy records, our special collections does have plenty of those more traditional rare books and maps spanning more than 400 years. And they do provide some excellent context for now extinct or evolved species of flora and fauna. And we'll take a quick peek at a few of those. So how can we improve on what we have? Well, with generosity and a bit of luck, we hope to develop our already strong holdings into a multifaceted digital portal where users can engage with digital records across USF Libraries collections, as well as a place where we can house and provide access to current data sets. And so that is our long-term goal of what we hope to accomplish. To show everyone the potential of what our collections already hold, we've prepared, prepared this virtual tour that you'll look at tonight to get kind of a peek at our materials. This is in no way exhaustive. This is not even the tip of the iceberg of what we hold up on the fourth floor at the library. It offers you a teaser, um, if you will, and it shows you what we could accomplish through a full portal. The Flynn Virtual Tour Hub that you'll see tonight is our launch pad, and it is designed to support research and discovery for students, scholars, and the community alike. So I'm going to go ahead and head over to the hub. And I'll go ahead and also just turn on my camera. All right. Okay. So this is the main page of the hub, which I'm sure many of you have seen now. Uh, Maggie did share the link in the chat for everyone to take a look at. You'll see that there's a main landing page on our hub that supports six branch pages that will highlight materials as they relate to different ecosystems that we've kind of lumped things into just for the sake of giving them a nice little home. Um, these collections that are on the separate pages that we'll look at didn't come in together as a package, but they do support research within certain ecosystems. There's plenty of intersectionality between these collections, and so we'll show you a little bit of that as we go through as well. So the page has an introduction to our initiative, which we've talked about already to this evening, and it also has a little bit of background on process. One thing that's particularly um, focused on in our process section here is how we acquire materials and how we bring them to digitization. And we think that this section would be particularly interesting to student users who might want to know a little bit more about how it is that we actually acquire a meta collection over time. A lot of these materials have been donated and supported through work done by our special collections librarian, Andy Hughes, and his relationships with the various Audubon organizations across the state, and as well as working with our professors on campus, which have brought in several really fascinating collections for us recently. So there's some links here that would help you learn a little bit more about what we do and how to visit our collections, as well as how to view a lot of our digital collections. We have a great partnership with the Digital Scholarship Services Department on campus, and they are working very hard to digitize as much as they can, as quickly as they can, um, to get this material online and available for users, which is really excellent. And we really value the work and partnership that we have with them. So you can click into the digital collections there to view some of those materials. There's also a link for Scholar Commons, which is our institutional repository, a great home for faculty research and publications. So many of you are probably familiar with that from a faculty standpoint, and there's great research there. The link that is provided will take you specifically to Florida Environment and Natural History works by faculty in Scholar Commons. So it's a curated list that they've put together. And finally, there's one for sharing some of our other public and final outcomes when we have our finding aids complete for this area, as well as a link to the Florida Environmental Interface that was curated by our research platform teams. So lots of exciting material. Below our process section, there's a section on our collections. So each of these are a button that will take you out to our little gallery sections that I'll show you tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and skip past it just for now and we'll come right back up to it because I just want to show you the bottom of the main landing page, which includes a map that 
shows where many of our collections came from. So clicking there on the panhandle, you can see Wakula Springs Audubon, and that has um, a lot of our warden reports from the 1960s. If you click on the images available, they'll take you to the finding aids for that material so you can learn more about them. So you can click across the state and see just a little glimpse of what is offered from these collections. And then finally at the bottom, we've highlighted some of the resources around campus. Many of these resources we do have partnerships with or the library has partnerships with that they've worked with. And we really do want to highlight this excellent interactive interdisciplinary work that's being done around campus. And it's what we're hoping to really highlight through a hub. And so we have this link down here at the bottom just to kind of show you a glimpse of how much excellent work's being done on campus. This is just our preliminary list. So if you know of other resources we could add to this, we're always welcome uh, to add and update our page as we go through. And then finally at the bottom, we just have some contact information uh, so that you could send us an email, follow us on Facebook, um, or just give us a give us a call if you need to check out some materials. So, all right, so I'm gonna scroll back up to the collections. And tonight I will try to not scroll so fast that I make anyone seasick, I promise. Well, I'll try at least. Um, so tonight I do wanna show you our three main ecosystem pages and some of our holdings. And I wanna encourage you guys to take a closer look at the pages when you have some time. But to start, I do wanna just step into the past a little bit. I am a historian by training and take a look at some of our most valuable items from our rare books vault. So when you click in, it will take you to the page. And so this has all of our rare books um, highlights that we've compiled. The top links are hyperlinked. So when you click to them, it will take you to that section within the story map. And this first one starts with Flora Sinesis. The first um, work that I wanna show you is by Michael Boyne from the 1650s. And this is not only a stunning example of early woodblock printing that is complemented with hand coloring. We often bring this out for history of the book. You can see this, the woodblock etching on the edges here. But this extremely valuable book is also showing some of the plant life that was once native to um, Asia exclusively and being seen for the first time in Europe. Boyne was bringing back these sketches to show what he saw on his trips to Asia in the 1600s. Similarly, if we scroll and I'm gonna scroll down for you guys slowly here, you can see we have several other books available. I want to get to our fauna section and show you a few images from Mark Catesby's 1729 study on the American Southeast. So we'll just pass by some of these here. All right, so Catesby's Natural History of Carolina, Florida and the Bahama Islands. It's one of the first published studies of America's flora and fauna, North America's flora and fauna, sorry. And so it's again, a glimpse of a new place that Europeans hadn't seen before in a lot of detail. And so this was being sent back to Europe for distribution. And as you can see from this first picture with the ivory-billed woodpecker, it showed some animals today where there's some contestation over whether or not these are extinct. Um, there's been a few reported sightings since the 1940s, but for the most part, it is believed that the ivory-billed woodpecker is an extinct species, but was a common species that Catesby was able to record on his travels. And so we include just a few glimpses here of the book itself, as well as the images within it. These two books and others on this page are here to provide you with a bit of scope for our initiative by showing now endangered or extinct animals and once geographically isolated flora as popularly occurring for the scientists who came before us. In a way, they show us what is at stake in the research that we see with the ecosystem galleries that I'm gonna go ahead and move over to now. All right, so I'm gonna head down and we'll start with Audubon, we'll start in the air. So in many ways, Audubon is the core of our environmental collections and the records from the regional centers really did help kickstart what we have in our collections. Part of what we wanted to do with the hub as well 
was to highlight our relationships with our partners and without whom their work, uh, the work that we're doing wouldn't really be possible. So in particular here, we've highlighted the work of Dr. Ann Hodgson, for example. She is an ornithologist and businesswoman who has helped us not only acquire collections and grants, but she has also sat down with other scientists to conduct interviews for the Tampa Bay Estuaries Oral History Program and worked tirelessly with our archivist, Andy Hughes, to help us find new collections and add to what we've been working through. So we really appreciate all of the hard work that Anne has put into these uh, collections for us, and we look forward to really for continuing that relationship with her in the years to come. Tonight, we're also, um, it's also our pleasure to welcome Dr. Lisa Corte from the Sanctuary Director at the Audubon Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary just outside Naval. So welcome, Lisa. Not only is Corkscrew a donor of material, but they're also a partner in an exciting new oral history project documenting the lives of Audubon employees, researchers, and volunteers in Florida. So as I go through the pages tonight, you'll notice that I'm going to point out a couple of our donors and supporters. Um, and we are just so appreciative of everyone's support so far in helping us build what is truly a community effort. That is what is important here, that we're all coming together and working as a community to help get these records available. All right, so we'll go ahead and just show you guys a few of our research center archives that we have. I've put in some items from Audubon Coastal Island Sanctuary here. This was the first sanctuary in Tampa Bay, started in the 1930s. The preview that I have is actually from the 80s, however, it's looking at pelicans and whiskey stump, but it gives you a little bit of an idea of the daily types of records that we've collected over time. And our records do date back, I believe, into the 1920s, but they really kick up in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s and carry into the 2000s. So there's lots of materials across our Audubon collections that could be useful to scientists studying all different elements of species changes and climate change and habitat loss. Our Lorida collection shows some glimpses of wildlife sanctuary reports, checklists of animals when they were seen and when they were not seen, how many were seen in these areas. The Audubon Florida Everglades Science Research Center at Tavernier. We have some really stunning photos with this collection as well as some of the research on white crowned pigeons, including this tracker, a little bit different than modern geolocators, but in the 1960s, these types of bands were what had to do. And so we have some artifacts like this in our collection that are available for research and complement the guidebooks um, and field notes that were kept by the scientists in these areas. And we've also provided a spotlight on prominent ornithologist, Robert Porter Allen. Allen's lifetime of work saving birds like the roseate spoonbill from extinction has been really a particularly special collection for us. I think we're all a little attached to Robert Porter Allen at this point with his work that we have and that we've been working to digitize. We are uh, collaborating with digital collections to fully digitize the Robert Porter Allen collection to make it available and you can click above the gallery here to follow the link and go to see what has been digitized already from Robert Porter Allen. This is an ongoing process that the DSS team is working on actively. And so expect regular changes on this if it's something that interests you. And in the gallery, I provided a few images, including Allen's famous sketching, some of his tracking information and his reviews, as well as a little glimpse of one of his letters from the 1940s. Below this, you'll see some data sets. We are at the very beginning of be to digitizing these types of data sets. We have quite a few that have been coming in over time. And so this is a work in progress. We're really excited to incorporate more scientific data into the collections. This is an area that we'd like to grow in. And so this tells you just a little bit about it. And it's an area that we're working to expand. All right, so I'm gonna pop back over and we'll dive into the water exhibits. Sorry, I had to do it. Okay. So as you can see, each of the pages does really cover a similar kind of format with an introduction to the collection and then a breakdown into further sub collections with the clickable links at the top that are available. We have a few images here from the Marine Science Department in the 1970s that I really enjoy to kind of kick off the gallery. 
Our first major highlight on the water page is the exciting new addition from the Dr. John C. Ogden Caribbean and Coral Reef Collection. Um, and welcome this evening, Dr. Ogden. We're excited to have you here. This collection includes binders from over three decades of research, material from Dr. Ogden's career as a marine biology professor here at USF and his work as the director of the Florida Institute of Oceanography. The records include work written by Dr. Ogden as well as his wife, Dr. Nancy Ogden, field notes, photographs taken during their research, um, reports that they've done over the years, maps, um, including maps that they have marked up based on where they've been working. So lots of really excellent research material covering a span of time where we saw quite significant changes to coral reefs around the world. So we're extremely thrilled to have this collection. We also want to thank Dr. Ogden for his generous support of a fund to accompany his collection that supports the digitization of his materials and the support of a student through a scholarship. After the tour, our development officer, Sydney, or sorry, our development officer, Christina Wise, will tell you a little bit more about this exciting fund. So I'm gonna go ahead and just jump through a few more of our collections and get down to our Tampa Bay Estuaries collection. As we mentioned previously, these partnerships have been really important to us, including our work with Dr. Hodgson on the Tampa Bay Estuaries Oral History Project. So if you'd like to take a look at some of these interviews, we have them linked here and available. We've also embedded uh, one of the interviews with Roy Robin Lewis. So that you can watch it right in the in the hub if you'd like, and there's links to take you out to watch many more of these wonderful oral history interviews that were video recorded, and so they're available for review. Uh, Roy Robin Lewis also worked in Tampa throughout his career, including with several local figures and scientists like Dr. Ronald Phillips, which we included part of his journaling here. These were all donated by Lewis later in life. And uh, Dr. Phillips's work covers the late 50s and early 60s. And so we have his diaries showing different uh, marshes and water around Tampa. Right. So one of our really prominent uh, water collections over time is actually hydrogeology with Gerald Parker's collection. The Gerald Parker Collection provides insight into the founding of hydrogeology, so taking us back a little bit. Our holdings include papers, project notes, notebooks, publications, photographs, and more that once belonged to the father of Florida groundwater hydrogeology. As with Robert Porter Allen's collection, our digital collections department is working to digitize Parker's influential work, uh, including this journal here, which they have digitized in full. So you are able to click the link above and you can go and view the full text of this uh, digitized in high resolution by our digital collections department. So we've included some from there as well as one of his field notebooks, which is also available for research. And below Dr. Parker's collection, we have some highlights of more of the library's partnerships, in particular with the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative and the Sea Image Program. This initiative um, is helping with supporting the publication of current data. It just wrapped up a 10-year project of collecting data on oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico and helping to make that data widely available. So there's links there to learn more about it. And while this is not a special collection per se, it does complement our special collection. So we wanted to be sure to kind of mention this again, intersectionality between our library departments. It complements the Richard Skip Davis collection, which has different elements on, on our coastal and geological illustrations, as well as oil spills. We also have some rare books that focus on oil spills and early reporting on oil spills. And so they all can work together. All right, so below our fascinating section here on politics, which we'll come back to in the next exhibit, we do have a preview of how our Flynn collections will help to continue to grow in the coming years. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll us past these political collections and our adorable manatee. Okay, so Special Collections is currently working with the research platform team for geosciences in the library, which includes Megan Cook and Matt Torrance. 
And we're working with Dr. Tom Chrisman from Geosciences, who's here tonight, welcome Dr. Chrisman, to learn more about his prestigious career. And linked here in the tour is a recent podcast interview with Dr. Chrisman discussing his work on the future of water policy. It's really fascinating. I recommend you take the time and give it a listen. We are so excited to continue our conversations with Dr. Christmas and learn more about his research at USF. Megan and Matt are both here tonight as well for questions after the tour. And so if you'd like to learn more about their work and how they can support your research, definitely give them a shout in the Q&A after this. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and back out and just jump into one last gallery for you because I think you guys are kind of getting the hang of it so far, what we've got going on here. In the land exhibit, what I really wanna focus on is some of the ways that this can support social sciences. Now on our land page, we do have um, some of the scientific approach with the library's karst information portal. And we have a geospatial approach as seen through excellent work being done by the Digital Humanities and Heritage Collections Department. And we're also incorporating research though that supports historical and social science environmental policy over the years. So I'm gonna go ahead and just jump to the environmental legislation collection because it's a pretty long page here. All right, so we do have over 60 years of political papers in our collections reflecting local, state and federal initiatives to slow the impacts of air pollution, coastal erosion and climate change. Of particular interest highlighted here, you can flip through some of the papers from Governor Leroy Collins, Congressman Sam Gibbons, State Representative Terrell Sessoms, Tampa Mayor Pam Iorio, and Hillsborough County Commissioner Jan Platt. So I'll go ahead and just scroll through. There's not as many pretty pictures in this section, but there's some really valuable documents. If you're working on anything to do with environmental policy, these materials can be really helpful for the debates that surrounded the formation. So Jan Platt's papers include her work to establish ELAP, the Environmental Lands Acquisition and Protection Program. Um, and it can be seen here through our little um, our later political collections like Mayor Iorio's, which I just skimmed by. So you can see Iorio has some information on this from its fifth year. And stopping in our, our ELAP gallery here, there's a lot of nice photos that illustrate what Tampa's environment and Hillsborough County's environment was looking like in the mid 1990s. This helps fill in some gaps. We have a lot of stuff from the 30s and 40s. We have contemporary photos. And so things like our ELAP collection can kind of fill in in between for local lands. There are a significant number of papers supporting this collection if you're interested in the social science aspect of it. So that is available as well. Our papers do span into the 21st century with additions from Congressman Jim Davis and his work at the state and federal levels. And so you're able to kind of get a peek. Some of these are from the late 90s and then his work does span into the 2000s as well. And finally, we do end, end the page with a little bit of local activism for you, uh, particularly organizing at USF's campus. We thought this might be interesting, particularly for some student users. We have some posters from events, as well as things stretching back into the 1970s, showing some student activism around campus. So lots of things of interest from a variety of perspectives. So we do hope that you enjoyed looking through these items. There are far more to go over than I could ever show you um, in what could be anything close to an interesting tour. So we're gonna go ahead and stop there with the showing of the website and our collection specialist, Sydney Jordan, is going to tell you just a little bit more about our services. All right, well, good evening, everyone. So I'll be discussing a few different ways in which you can engage with the work you've seen tonight and interact more with our Flint materials. So if you're interested in viewing these or any other items in special collections, we're currently open via appointment only for socially distanced visits. As part of our continuity of operations plan, we've shifted instructional sessions for USF students online. Currently, we're able to provide curated story maps and primary resource hubs to support virtual learning. Sessions for both our spring and fall semesters have had similar layouts to the pages that you've previewed this evening, though we do have different themes and uh, flexibilities we can work with um, with our programming. 
To date, our personnel have completed targeted pages for history and literature courses that match special collections resources with specific course themes. Um, so these sessions allow students to learn about and become engaged with research methods and also um, it gives them an experience to incorporate primary resource materials into their coursework. So if you're interested in working with special collections, please don't hesitate to reach out to us via email and we very much look forward to working with you. Um, also, one thing we'd like to mention as well is before transitioning to remote work, we did curate a physical exhibit to showcase our environmental collections. It is still up in, in the library, um, though we are at a limited service capacity at the moment. So in order to mediate that, we've actually replicated this exhibit in a virtual format to assure that our patrons could access the content remotely. It's part of the Flynn web page, which is the link that we've provided in the chat, and we invite you to navigate through the page on the story map and see what types of materials we have to offer at special collections. And I believe right now after that, um, we will be turning the chat over to Christina Wise, our development officer, to talk a little bit more about the funds and things we have available to support Flynn. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sydney. Um, once again, kind of just wanted to echo what Amanda said. Uh, thank you guys so much for spending your Thursday evening with us. Um, although we miss being with you in person, it's really great to connect with all of you um, virtually. So I did want to briefly discuss the ways that you can support this exciting new collection initiative. And as you can see, Amanda just gave us a brief overview of what's possible with these collections and the sky is really the limit. Um, currently, we do have two funds to support our collections. And the first one is the Dr. John Ogden Coral Reef Collection Fund. Dr. Ogden and his wife, Dr. Nancy Ogden, graciously established this fund and it provides money for all expenses related to the Dr. John Ogden Coral Reef Collection, including preservation, upkeep, and digitization. And in addition, this fund also has a scholarship component to provide a scholarship to a student at USF pursuing any major on any campus who's doing research with the collection. And something that's really wonderful um, and great about scholarships in the library is that a lot of them are open to students pursuing any major and they're not restricted to a specific college or campus. So in 2019 and 2020 and in 2020, 2021, the library awarded over 30 students $30,000. So that's really great. And the second fund that will support our new initiative is the USF Tampa Library Environment and Natural History Collection Fund. And this supports all related expenses for the collections you saw today and much more including but not limited to preservation and digitization. And now we want to open it up for a Q&A. So if any of you have questions about anything that we discussed tonight, um, you can either use the raise your hand feature or you can type your questions in the chat. Betty, you have a question. Go ahead. Can you unmute yourself, Betty? You might be muted. There's a microphone up at the top towards the right hand corner. OK. I was just wondering if um, Richard Wonderland has any of his work in um, in the collection. He is a um, plant person. <laughs> he was a professor at USF. And I know I'm in the Native Plant Society and um, he's like God in that society. He's written a book and he's cataloged everything. Yeah. So I wondered if he's given anything to the uh, library. So Andy, did you you want to take that or I can take that? Sure. Um, no, uh, not that I know of, um, but that's a, a great person to reach out to. Yeah. Yeah, Betty. Uh, Absolutely, that's great. A couple of years ago, Betty, uh, this is Todd, by the way. The, yeah, um, hi, Todd. A couple of years ago, we did reach out to uh, Richard and his his colleague, and um, 
And I, I think what they wanted to do was to keep that collection intact. So it essentially now it's it stayed with the herbarium, and um, they've they've retained that collection uh, fully intact. But the materials are there now. We do have uh, some of the rare books that were part of his collection in the library uh, because we had better preservation conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do have that. And we did catalog his entire collection so that other people would be aware of what was out there. Because you're right, he, he literally was the, the, the god of Florida plants, Florida and Caribbean. And um, his work was amazing, All, just decades of work that had been done. Yeah, and I'll just jump in. This is Sydney again. Um, one thing that might be of interest as well that's part of our records on our land page, we do have a showcase for the Rita B. and James Laster Botany Collection. So both of them were members of the Suncoast Native Plant Society. Some of their findings are there as well as other publications in support. And we also right now have the records for the Temple Terrace Garden Club as well. So those are other related organizations that might be of interest for you. Thank you, Betty. Carol Elwood in the chat asks, how did you get the Robert Porter Allen papers? How do you generally pro procure collections? Uh, yeah, this is Andy Hughes. Um, it's It's been quite an adventure. I think watching this, the little show with um, with Amanda, it's like watching the ten last 10 years of my life kind of flash before my eyes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of it started with Robert Porter Allen. It really started with the Skip Gandy collection in 2011, but um, it was right around 2012, 2013, I believe, that um, I think it was 2012, went to Tavernier for the first time. Ann Hodgson um, had some contacts in Tavernier. Uh, Jerry Lorenz, who's um, a great ornithologist himself, um, we visited with him down there and he knew he had a bunch of stuff in his attic <clears throat> and uh, it had been sitting in an attic uh, unair conditioned for a long time. I'm not sure how long, um, but um, thankfully, uh, you know, he and, and Anne were uh, happy to see it go to a, a place that where it could be preserved. I have to admit, I, I didn't quite know what I had when I was driving back to campus from, from uh, Tavernier. But Todd knew immediately, and then once I heard the words "whooping crane," then I was clued in. Uh, I, I knew who he was, but I didn't know how kind of um, influential he was. Um, but a lot of the times, that's how we get our collections: is um, you know, generous people donating the materials, and um, and then kind of we take it from there. And uh, that really began the our partnership with the Audubon. Uh, and thanks in large part to Jerry Lorenz and, and to Ann Hodgson. Andy, or maybe someone from Special Collections, could you speak to her second question? How do you generally procure, procure collections? Right. I mean, it's usually through a donation process. Like I said, uh, you know, we get a, a generous donor. Someone will call us up. Um, so uh, that's how this really began was, um, you know, Ann knew that there was some some old materials there, uh, but I guess, you know, I don't know if anyone knew quite what they had. And I know that like Jerry didn't quite know either until um, digital materials, you know, started to be generated by the library and he was able to explore uh, his own collections. So, you know, he found stuff um, through the di digitization process that he never would have known was even there. <clears throat> but it's usually through the donation process um, for the most part. And, you know, it's, um, I think it's a big um, advantage to work with scientists and the people who are actually doing the research, you know, because nobody knows the, the impact more than they. You know. Thanks, Andy. Another question from tomorrow. Can Andy share with us his experiences working with the ornithology intern during the fall 2019 and spring 2020 semesters and the work they were able to accomplish as part of the internship? Yeah, we had a really, we had a great student. Um, uh, her name was Wanda, and uh, she um, she herself is a budding ornithologist, um, and it was it was great to, to be able to work with her. Um, yeah, she, you know, what was amazing was, I don't know if she knew what she was getting into. <laughs> we know when she got um, 
the position over with us and, and uh, was able to go through the papers of Robert Porter Allen. I mean, I, I began by giving her the book, The Man Who Saved the Whooping Crane, to read. Um, and I gave her a few boxes to just to just wander through. Um, and, you know, she was very jazzed <laughs> early on in the semester. So she was really able to do a lot um, to make a really extensive bibliography around Audubon, Florida, um, Robert Porter Allen's work um, and the other work that, you know, our collections touch upon. Um, so and then, you know, this is all the beginning of her her own career as a you know, as a student and learning science and everything else. So um, for her, I, I know it was um, it was a great experience. And, you know, unfortunately, the COVID you know, thing came along and sort of disrupted our spring. But we look forward to getting back to uh, back in the trenches again. So. Thanks, Andy. Tamara asks, are there plans to link out to research, especially student research that utilizes the collection? So absolutely, I, I would say yes. Yeah, one of the I, I this is Todd again. Uh, I'm sorry, Andy, I didn't mean to to speak over, but um, one of the things that um, that we're trying to do through this effort is to pull together collections that at one time were considered, um, in a sense, in in their own stovepipe and their own very self-contained collections, and try to create those linkages. And so we've got this, um, we've got Scholar Commons, which is our institutional repository. And one of the things that we collect there are all of the dissertations and theses that are done by our students. And part of, and that collection includes honors theses that are done by students that are in the honors college. So as we, um, as we review the content and uh, the, the team will curate a collection, they pull together materials <clears throat> that either will complement these collections or were perhaps generated from these collections. And uh, so at the end of the day, what you end up with are not 20 or 30 separate small collections. You end up with one large, very rich, very interconnected, carefully curated collection that tells a much better story. So yes, the student, uh, student research is on the list and, and, and some, of it, some of that work has actually already been done. Thank you both. Kai asked a question, which I think Sydney might be answering in the chat, so maybe Sydney, you can answer this verbally as well. But Kai says, I know University of Alaska Fairbanks Herbarium was digitizing their collection about 10 years ago. Do libraries coordinate with those types of efforts? And do you know if a similar effort being made to preserve the USF Herbarium collection is being done digitally? It is, it is an amazing resource. So th this is Todd again, and, and Sydney has provided some information um, in the in the chat field, um, and they have actually done quite a lot of digitization work. And the Plant Atlas, which is one of those resources that we link to through our our Flynn collection, um, is the result of a lot of that digitization work. So not only have they worked on digitizing the print materials which would be a very traditional thing for libraries to do. They've also gotten involved in uh, scanning, 3D scanning some of their botanical collections, particularly the, the type specimens that are of critical importance to uh, researchers in Florida and the Caribbean. So that work is ongoing and we do link to that work. And um, to the extent that any project at the University of South Florida that's done that touches on this collection, uh, we're going to be, re we will and do reach out to them to form those partnerships so that we can pull them into this meta collection. Thank you, Todd. Any further questions? All right, we have one from John Clark. How long did the digitization process for the Flynn collections take? Were there any issues with documents like field journals being damaged by exposure to the elements, or were most of the collections pretty well preserved? Um, I can speak to that a little bit. I am, 
you know, for the most part, they're in surprisingly good shape. Um, some of them have water damage and have fallen apart, at least like little pads and things like that. A lot of these weren't really made to last. Um, but for the most part, I, I could say we're, I'm pretty surprised that, you know, that most of them are in really good shape, especially considering the rough, you know, um, the elements that a lot of stuff had been through, um, especially, you know, anyone doing field research knows, um, you know, the weather, the climate, it's, it's all pretty variable. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then but as far as, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, ahead, but, but just, ahead, the digitization is just, it's ongoing. So, I mean, it's, um, it's going to be a long uh, process. There's a lot of materials here. So that's, it's one of the things. And then also eventually getting things like data sets, um, you know, inputted in would be really helpful too. So people can, can deal with large volumes of raw data um, rather than, you know, looking at notebooks and things. And then I'll just mention as well, as part of just the general archival process, when we intake materials, all of the collections are processed in house before we transfer over to our digital department, who then makes the surrogates that are hosted online. And like Andy said, a lot of these uh, environmental materials in particular were at outposts that were probably on air conditioned in the Keys and similar um, instances like that. Um, so we do have things like um, one common thing that I found in many of the environmental collections is things that were stapled together. The staples are terribly rusty. Um, but a lot of that we're able to mitigate beforehand before it's digitized. We remove the staples, um, we rehouse everything in um, acid free folders, as well as, you know, replace any metal bits with plastic fastenings um, and things like that take care of a little bit of the damage we see at the front end, as well as um, quarantining materials. Um, if there were, you know, bugs or anything like that, just being in a Florida attic. Um, so, so much of that work is done beforehand. And then in the digital department, I mean, some of the, the papers and things like that are a little frail, but they're handled with care. And then once we have a digital surrogate um, that is made available and helps mediate any prolonged damage that might come from environmental causes. But I think that gives you an idea of how much effort kind of goes into to all this stuff. Um, uh, before it even gets to the digital unit. I'll wait a moment for any any further questions. All right, Kathy asks, do you have a volunteer program? Um, not currently just because of the kind of conditions we're, we're operating under at the moment. Um, that's, uh, we certainly had volunteers in the past. Um, I once had team Gibbons, a whole, uh, team of student volunteers working around Congressman Sam Gibbons papers. Um, so uh, we'd certainly love to do something like that. Um, we do host interns. <clears throat> All right, thank you all for your questions. Todd, I'll pass it back over to you. Thank you. Um, I, on behalf of all my colleagues, um, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight, uh, both to celebrate National Estuaries Week and also to allow us to share the results of our work on the USF Libraries Florida and Environment Natural History Collections Initiative. We hope that uh, you share our excitement around the potential for this collection and encourage you to support this important work in any way you feel comfortable. Uh, there's uh, some information up for contact information for Christina, also special collections. And of course, many of you uh, know my email and you're I'm very happy to receive emails from anyone. Um, any suggestions, comments, uh, complaints all go to Christina. But if it comes to uh, comments or suggestions or praise, please send that to me. I'd be very pleased to receive it. 
But uh, thank you very much. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Go Bulls.